wet sculpture weighs over 204 metric tons, measures 305 feet tall, wears a shoe sized 879, and is hit by over 600 lightning bolts each year. That's right, that's the Statue of Liberty. Let's dive into a little different perspective on this iconic work of art. This episode is funded by the Glick Fund and the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation, who inspire philanthropy and creativity. The Statue of Liberty now stands as a monumental symbol for freedom and welcoming people to the U.S. But for one crazy, passionate artist named Frédéric Auguste Bartoli, it was his chance to create an epic lighthouse sculpture, gilded with gold. Or at least that was his plan. Just after the Civil War came to an end in 1865, the Frenchman Édouard de Laboulet was trying to find nonviolent ways to inspire France towards democracy. He decided, let's celebrate that country over the pond, building democracy, and give them a statue. Laboulet commissioned Bartoli to help him out. Bartholdi studied architecture at the famous École des Beaux-Arts, which also happens to be where Georges Seurat studied as well. After that, he studied painting, but once he turned his attention to sculpture, it was all over. The huge turning point for Bartholdi was in 1855, when he traveled to Egypt and witnessed the Sphinx and the Pyramids of Giza. In fact, the Statue of Liberty was inspired by the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Bartholdi got the commission from the French to build his statue for the U.S. instead, but he did not get all the cash he needed. Thankfully, Bartholdi wasn't just creative with sculpture, he was also pretty crafty in marketing. The project was supposed to be a joint effort. The French take care of the sculpture while the Americans take care of the pedestal. But on both sides of the pond, funding was anything but easy. France raised the cash through public fees, entertainment, and even a lottery. Yeah. The U.S. first tried theatrical events, art exhibitions, and even prize fights. But these events weren't even coming close to raising enough cash. This is where the sculptor got pretty creative. He teamed up with Joseph Pulitzer and opened a page in his newspaper, The World, where he slams both the rich and the middle class for not forking over the necessary funding. That's, that's one way to do it. They also decided to print the names of anyone who donated to the statue in the newspaper, even if it was just a penny. Now that was a brilliant marketing move, which brought in, get this, $102,000. That's 80% of the total had been received in sums less than like a dollar. Pretty amazing. Finally, construction began in 1875. To create the Statue of Liberty enlightening the world, Bartholdi needed the help of Alexandre Gustave Eiffel to create the skeleton that would hold the enormous copper sheets. And yes, you guessed correctly, that is the same guy who designed the Eiffel Tower in Paris. To do this, they designed the skeleton out of iron pylon and steel that allowed the copper skin to move independently since they knew there would be strong winds and changing temperatures in the New York Harbor. Copper would easily expand and contract with the changing temperatures as opposed to stone or bronze. Several models of the statue were created. Then artists used some sweet math in order to create the necessary pieces on a giant scale. The sculpture technique they used was called repoussé, which is where you would create huge molds out of wood and plaster and then hammer sheets of copper metal inside the molds. This technique dates back to 3rd century BC in the Middle East. Each piece of copper had to be annealed, which means heating it up to until it was bright red and then cleaning it to remove the pitch or tar-like black substance left behind. Repoussé is an incredibly difficult art form to do, which requires skill and tons of patience. As you can imagine, construction was incredibly time consuming, exhausting, and probably crazy noisy. Lots of hammering. In fact, nearly 300 different types of hammers were used in the construction of the Statue of Liberty. Before the entire statue was completed, the head was on display at the World's Fair in Paris in 1878, where you could pay to go up into the crown. Bartholdi always finding a way to make more cash. Finally, in 1885, the statue was completed using nearly 31 tons of copper and 125 tons of steel. At the time, the Statue of Liberty's design and construction were recognized as one of the greatest technical achievements. It was known as the bridge between art and engineering. The 300 copper pieces were loaded onto the French ship Isère, which almost sank in stormy seas. 
Interestingly, Thomas Edison in 1878 had originally told the newspapers that he would design a monster disc for the inside, which would deliver speeches that could be heard across New York. Thankfully, the idea of hearing the Statue of Liberty speaking didn't catch on. In October of 1886, the statue was unveiled. Like many works of art, this one also had its fair share of negative publicity. In fact, the women's suffrage movement despised the fact that a woman would stand in New York Harbor representing liberty at a time when most American women had no liberty to vote. Only two women attended the actual unveiling, Bartholdi's wife and daughter. The Statue of Liberty now represents so much more, and it most certainly stands for one amazing work of sculpture, innovation, and persistent passion of an artist who desperately wanted to sculpt a colossal sculpture. While in New York, we had the chance to meet with an artist and park ranger out on Liberty Island to learn even more. Check this out. We are in New York City on Liberty Island with Jim Elkin. Jim, thank you so much for your time. And uh, as if you don't mind letting everybody know, I'm really fascinated that you're not just a park ranger, but you also have experience with, uh, are you an artist yourself? Correct, I've uh, all my life been involved in both art and science, and this, the Park Service offers the opportunity to explore both. Isn't it though, wow. I mean, so the year, so when they built this, how in the world did they even start? And then I assume when they were building it in France, mm -hmm. I mean, how, what did that look like? How do they do it? Well, the idea is the easy part, coming up with an idea, <laughs> carrying the idea out is the monumental part. Uh, the face, we believe, is influenced by Bartholdi's mother, who was really? a very strong person in his life. And she is really a goddess, so a female god. She's inspired by Libertas, who was the goddess of freedom in ancient Roman times. And Roman is the theme because she is a Roman goddess and she holds in her left hand a Roman tablet on which there are Roman numerals. Right, yeah. a lot of connections back here, yeah. Mm -hmm. We actually made the bottom part of it. Yes, right. okay. and the very bottom part predates everything above. It is a fort. So it is a fort that would defend America. So it's kind of ironic, freedom uh, is really uh, embodied in this fort right here at the bottom, a strong defense, so to speak. And we have rising out of this fort, the American app, which nobody sees, because <laughs> your eye goes right up to her, yeah. and it, the pedestal is invisible, but that's another great artist who no one gives much credit to, Richard Morris Hunt. And Hunt uh, created this wonderful pedestal that's vertical. And why is it vertical? Because it offsets the enormous horizontal motif of the fort. So it's vertical and it does not compete with, but rather accentuates the beauty of the statue that stands upon it. June 19th of 1885, she arrived here on the steamship Isaire, and there was the fort, and there was the unfinished pedestal. Oh no, <laughs> really? It took us eight agonizingly slow months to finally finish our pedestal while the crate sat mutely on the ground. When it was, when it first arrived at the torch itself, like it was on uh, an exhibit, like maybe in Philly somewhere? Or? Yes, so before there was a statue, the earliest piece was the right hand and torch, and that was brought to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the year 1876. So if you were out in Philly in 1876, you could go to the torch. Huh. And it was for an enormous price of 50 cents, which in Victorian economy was huge money. And the story just goes on and on, because even though it was here, the flame, which is different from the one up there, uh, was a hollow copper flame with no openings, glass, or lighting. Uh, and imagine this at night, pitch black. Now we have America's busiest harbor, shipping coming in and not being able to navigate. So America thought of this flame as a lighthouse beacon. Cut holes into it and put early lighting so that at night lighting would help shipping navigate through. The problem was uh, the artist was horrified. What are you doing to yeah, my yeah, gift? My I give you my, my, my masterpiece and you're, you're defiling it. By 1916, artist Gutzon Borglum, who you know from Mount Rushmore, put in 250 panels of amber colored glass, improperly sealed. The rain came in and the rain brought salt from the nearby Atlantic Ocean and salt and water 
and copper and iron interreacted in a galvanic electrolytic reaction, eating up the metal, holding her together, oh, wow. so that by 1984, she would have crashed to the ground had we not rescued her. She has 300,000 copper rivets holding her 310 sheets together. She's only two pennies thin. What does that tell you about the fragility of this thing in the New York Harbor, where we have the Atlantic Ocean in our backyard and the winds are slamming her constantly, had it not been for the secret of her strength, which lies within. Engineer, artists working together. It, and this is the beauty of it. Neoclassic art on the outside, ultra modern engineering on the inside, a century ahead of his time. Jim, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, did you know that subscribing to our channel is one of the most epic things you can do? That's right, subscribe now, share our episodes so that we can actually make more of these things. I'm not gonna lie, I love showing you where creativity and innovation are happening. Get on board and be outrageous.